Good morning, church family. It's good to be with you all this morning. Thank you for your prayers uh, for not only this morning, but for this evening as well. And uh, we look forward to a great day together uh, in the Lord. Let's grab our Bibles and go ahead and uh, <clears throat> turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We've made our way down in our study of God's blueprint for the church from the book of 1 Timothy down to chapter 6 and verse 6 is where we'll begin our reading today. And we'll read down through verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10. If you found your places there, I'll read this aloud. Read along with me. 1 Timothy 6 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we, can take not, we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But for those who desire to be rich, sorry, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. May the Lord add his blessing to the preaching, to the reading of his word through the preaching of his word this morning. Well, most likely at some point along the way, you have played this game either with a group of friends or maybe with your family sitting around the table. Someone will ask, Hypothetically, what would you do if you had a million dollars or a million euro? Immediately, our minds spring into action. What we would buy, where we would live, what we would spend it on, which holidays we would go on. And we'd continue just naming items that we imagine that if we could afford, would somehow make our life complete. During this game, it seems like the only thing that's really separating us from true happiness and fulfillment is just a bit of money. Now, I admit it's fun to play that game sometimes and to enter into that world of what if. And it's fun to imagine such an opportunity of the difference that a million euro could make in our lives. The sad reality is that reality paints a far bleaker picture when it comes to a person with an abundance of money in their lives. Listen to what some famous wealthy people have said. Henry Rockefeller, who at one point, his net worth represented about 1% of the total United States economy, said this, I've made millions and they have brought me no happiness. Henry Ford, who was the founder of Ford Motor Company and the pioneer of automated assembly lines, made millions. And he said this, I was happier when I was doing a mechanic's job. Jay Gould, another 19th century wealthy person in the U.S., who in the 19th century, the 1800s, had a net worth of over $100 million, reportedly said in his, with his dying breath, I suppose I'm the most miserable devil on earth. More contemporary examples. A guy called William Bud Post in 1988 won $16.2 million in the Pennsylvania lottery. And that's when things started to go wrong. His former girlfriend sued him for a share of the winnings and his brother actually hired a hitman to kill him. Post himself died, broke in 2006. Bob Harrell Jr. won $31 million in the Texas lottery in 1997. Now Bob bought his family lavish homes, bought them cars, purchased a ranch, and contributed much to his local church. He even gave 480 turkeys to homeless for Christmas. So far, so good, right? However, later on, life took a turn for the worse when this 
instant millionaire found himself coping with financial mismanagement and all sorts of issues in his personal life. 1999, he was found dead in his bedroom with a self-inflicted gunshot wound, saying to himself through his, or saying to his financial advisor, winning the lottery is the worst thing that ever happened to me. Now, these tragic stories and countless others like them only serve to illustrate the truth about money and the pursuit of it that we find in the passage before us today. The title of my message this morning is one that I actually borrow from a quote from none other than the Lord Jesus Christ this morning from Matthew chapter 12 and verse 22. I want to speak to you this morning on this subject, the deceitfulness of riches. I want us to see three things in this passage this morning. Number one, I want us to see an effective combination. And then I want us to look at a seductive infatuation And finally, consider a destructive affection. Let's look first at this effective combination. Look at verse 6 with me again. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Now, verse 6 Paul really begins here making what can not be described any other way than a very ironic statement, considering where we left off last week in verse 5. Right? In verse 5, he says he's rebuking false teachers who imagine that godliness is a means of gain. But then he turns right around in verse 6 and says, godliness is great gain. Now, what is godliness? Let's be reminded of what true godliness is. It speaks of piety towards God. Uh, it, it, it means to have characteristics of God-likeness. Godliness describes a person whose life resembles the nature and the character of God. No doubt there are people in your life that you've met, and, and when you speak about that person, you go, he is a godly man or she is a godly Young lady, they resemble the God reflected to us in the Bible. Now, Paul has spoken to us already in this epistle about godliness. You'll remember back in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, he said these words, For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. What is the difference then between the godliness in verse 5 and the godliness he's speaking of here in verse 6? Well, in verse 5, you'll recall, Paul is there referring to this pseudo or this false godliness of the false teachers. You say, how do you know it was a false godliness? Well, what were the false teachers doing? They were preaching a false gospel, and a false gospel has no capacity to produce true Godliness in anyone's life. Godliness is a work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. And only the Holy Holy Spirit only inhabits those who are in right relationship to God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so these false teachers and this counterfeit gospel was being used as a means of financial gain and profit. The false teachers were in it for the money. By by contrast, verse 7 in our passage today lets us know that the gain Paul is speaking here cannot and has nothing to do with material possessions. Look at verse 7. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. Paul here is speaking of material possessions and material wealth, and he just gives a, a standard, a truism. It's obvious. You can't take it with you. Some have observed quite keenly and quite accurately. There is no trailer hitch on a hearse. There's nothing hauled to the grave of the person who is to be buried. Whatever they amassed in their life remains behind. We will leave the world exactly the way we came into it, possessing nothing. Job. In the Old Testament, 
Now, he certainly knew about having great riches, but he also knew the pain of total loss. Listen to what Job said in chapter 1, verse 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. He's echoing what Paul is saying here, or rather Paul is echoing what Job has said. The wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon of Israel, said in Ecclesiastes 5.15 the very same thing. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again. Naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. Clearly then, the gain from godliness here spoken of is not a pursuit of riches and wealth. On the contrary, we will see that the pursuit of financial gain is actually a detractor of true godliness. Recall Jesus' words in Matthew 16, 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Answer, nothing. Proverbs 11.4 says, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from wrath. There's coming a day when every person who has ever lived is going to stand before God and give an account for what he has done with Jesus Christ on the earth. And, And no amount of possessions, no amount of wealth, no amount of money is going to be of any benefit to anyone on earth. That day, only the righteousness of Christ imputed into their lives will matter. So how do we reconcile this? Look back at verse 6. Paul says that godliness is an effective means to gain only if it is combined with contentment. Not godliness, Not contentment, godliness with contentment. What is is contentment? Well, contentment was a very popular concept among the philosophers of Paul's day. The word contentment literally translates self-sufficient. In other words, it speaks to this idea that I need nothing more for, for happiness and satisfaction in my life than than what I have inside of me. I'm dependent on nothing or no one else for my contentment or my satisfaction. Now, while Paul would certainly agree that circumstances should not affect our contentment, he would, however, go on to clarify for the believer the source of true contentment. I want you to flip over in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4 for just a moment. The reason I want to do that is because we're going to come back to Philippians 4 near the end. Philippians 4... Beginning in verse 11, the Apostle Paul says this, Now, I am not speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, that is to have nothing, and I know how to abound, that is to have much. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. What is the secret? I can do all things through Him, through Christ, who strengthens me. Our satisfaction is not found merely innately within ourselves. It's the satisfaction that knowing Christ is with us that leads to our contentment. And and Paul clarifies what he means when he uses the word contentment. Look at verse 8. But if we have food and clothing with these we will be content. Now, the word food here speaks of nourishment. That would include all that we need for our bodies to be nourished, including water. And clothing literally translates from the the original language there, covering, which the word is broad enough to, to include all sorts of covering, including shelter. So Paul's saying, he's making a general summary statement saying that all man needs for contentment are the basic necessities of life. I need nourishment and I need covering. Now we need to note here, because some will look at this and and, and they'll say things or think it says things that it doesn't say, or they'll try to make laws where there is no law here. This is not a, a command to God's people to enter into some sort of vow of poverty. 
nor is it a condemnation of having more than the basics of life, which would, in this context, rightly have to be considered luxuries. What is Paul getting at here? Paul is saying godliness with contentment. What does that look like? It's, it's called the Christian living, a simple lifestyle, a life of satisfaction that is grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ. This then is the gain that comes from com- the combination, the effective combination of godliness and contentment. What is this gain? It's a recognition that in Christ you already pa- have everything you need. Christ has promised to provide to you everything that you need. And we are called to be satisfied with that, whether that's little, whether that's much. So gain then in the Christian life is not an accumulation of wealth, but it comes in the satisfaction in knowing that you need nothing else. Some said it this way, the richest man is he who needs nothing else. And that's the lure of money. Riches are going to help me to get this thing and that thing and these things that I need. The richest man is he who needs nothing else. What is it then that robs us of contentment? Let's look at verse 9. And let's look at this seductive infatuation. Verse 9 says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Paul says those. Now I believe he is squarely pointing back at the false teachers that he's been addressing in this passage so far. But I believe what he says is true of the false teachers really can be true for any of us. Those who do what? Who desire to be rich. The word desire there is a very strong word. We see it quite often in our New Testament, particularly in Paul's writings. This word is usually used in terms of sexual desire. But as in some cases like here, not always Nevertheless, Paul is describing ones who have a passionate desire. You might say a lust for wealth and money and possessions. And again, I want to point out here, Paul here is not condemning wealth. Paul is not condemning possessions. Nor is Paul condemning those who are ambitious or hard workers. Paul is not giving us an excuse here to be lazy and not to have ambitions and drive in our lives. The Bible commands us to work hard and that all that we do is to be done wholeheartedly as unto the Lord. What is at issue here? What's at issue here is what's at issue in just about every case of the Christian life. Paul is addressing the heart of the matter. You see, the heart, our heart is the seat of our contentment. Am I satisfied in my heart? How do we know? Ask yourself this question. Ask yourself this question. What is your driving motivation or ambition when it comes to material things? Is it godliness? Am I striving for godliness or am I striving for greed? Am I motivated by godliness or am I motivated by greed? Paul here is giving a warning to the greedy. Look at what he says. Those who desire to be rich, they, in their pursuit of wealth, they fall into temptation. What is a temptation? Well, a temptation is designed to lure you away from godliness. You're never tempted to do something good. That's not what a temptation is. Temptations awakens and fuels desires that we already have. We remember the words of The half-brother of Jesus, the Apostle James in chapter 1 and verse 14 says this, Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? His own desire. Paul says they, they fall into temptation, into a snare. What is a snare? A snare is a trap. Many people hunt by the use of a snare. They hunt an animal. It's, 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 just a, it's a trap that said it's camouflaged so that the obvious danger that awaits the, the animal is hidden from sight. And to make matters worse, the snare is usually baited with something that the intended victim naturally craves. Perhaps a favorite food that they like to eat with the intent of drawing that animal in close enough 
that the trigger of the snare is released, meaning certain doom for the animal that's entrapped. What once held great promise of reward now has a hold of its victim. Well, let's ask ourselves this question. Where did this snare come from? Who, who's, who's out there setting snares for the, the Christian? Well, Paul uses this word snare two other times in his epistles to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 3, 7, we saw it, but we also see it in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 26. Both of these cases, this snare is modified and said to be the snare of the devil. So if that's Paul's implication here, and I, and I believe that it is, then he's saying the devil himself, the what? The great tempter presents and places temptations like bait in a trap designed to attract those who do what? Have a desire for these things. What does this look like in practical reality? Hey, the, the boss isn't looking. No one's going to know if I leave work early, but turn my time sheet in as though I worked my whole shift. I, I don't need to report this income on my taxes. No one's going to know. I, I, I know I can't afford this latest and greatest new phone, but I could just put it on my credit card, pay it off later. I know that this money, I ought to use it to buy groceries for my family, but, but just think how much better I'll be able to provide for them if this lottery ticket hits. And the trap is set. The temptation is awakened that desire for wealth. And once the person takes the bait, the trigger of the trap and the snare is sprung. And the devil has you trapped. Now, a good, a good snare is designed such that the more the captive struggles to get free, the tighter and tighter it squeezes its victim, making escape next to impossible. And this is exactly what Paul describes next. He says the ensnared person falls into many senseless and harmful desires. In other words, once caught in the trap, it becomes next to impossible to escape. The initial fall into temptation leads to further compromise, either to cover up the prior compromise, I've got to lie to cover up my deceit. Or, if for some reason the person gets away with it, they're emboldened to do it more, to do it bigger, to do it better. All kinds of decisions are made that if a person was thinking clearly, if they were thinking biblically, if they were thinking with godliness in mind, they would never do. But what's happening? Their insatiable desires have them behaving in ways that are beyond rational explanation. Before they know it, they no longer understand what it is they're doing or quite exactly how they got there. Senseless, harmful desires. They're out of control. They're ruining not only their own lives, but oftentimes the lives of those around them. They find themselves in over their heads which is precisely how Paul describes them next. He says they are, look again at verse 9, they are plunged into ruin and destruction. Perhaps you've gone swimming at a lake or at a swimming pool before and you've plunged into that water. And, and this word here means exactly that. It's to be forced under as, a, as if underwater, dragged to the bottom. Drowning is the imagery here. And as such, Paul says, they experience ruin and destruction. And these two words are very similar. And they really summarize and speak to irretrievable loss that's experienced by these who are entrapped. There is a subtle distinction that could be made between these words. Ruin, when it's used in our Bible, usually speaks to a physical ruining, speaks of a ruin or, or, a or, or, or a loss in this life. You could think of it as bodily loss, loss of job, loss of money, loss of many things in this life. Destruction is often used to describe an eternal destruction, an eternal loss. It's, it's really 
a description of, of hell. John Stott, the great theologian, said it this way in summarizing this verse. The irony is that those who have been motivated and set their hearts on gain in the end find that it's total loss. Now you would think with such stark warnings and with sadly so many examples that have been lived out tragically before our eyes, people would know better. And such stories would just be relegated to history. Sadly, this is not the case. And in verse 10, we, we see why. For it's here we learn about the underlying cause. Look at verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And we had a little bit of fun on our WhatsApp group yesterday because what Paul has just given us here is really another truism. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a popular expression uh, that m- many of us, I'm sure, have heard. Perhaps we've even said it through the years. But I wonder if we perhaps heard this slightly incorrectly or repeated it slightly incorrectly. Maybe, maybe you've heard it this way. Money is the root of all evil, right? Now, you guys did very well. You guys all disagreed that that's actually true, right? (laughs) So so well done. But but I want to notice three variances between this common cliche and what the Bible actually says. You guys greatly picked up on this yesterday. The Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. Look, all evil, look what it says. For the love of money. Paul identifies this love as a craving. Again, you have this desire, this, this idea of a desire, Right? But but money's not the issue. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to do what? Get wealth. Money is money is not the issue. Like, like most things, money is morally neutral. It, it it's amoral. You know, we use all kinds of examples to 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 say this. You know, is is a knife evil? Well, it depends. <laughs> What's in your heart when you pick up that knife to use it? Is it to spread butter on your toast, work away? Is it to go and take care of a problem with your neighbor? That's a problem. But, but, but money is, is, is like that in and of itself. It, it's, not, it's not good or evil. What was the problem? It's the love of money that's problematic. Now, why is the love of money a problem? Here it is. You worship what you love. Or to say it another way, what you love most is what you worship. That's why Jesus said in Luke 16, 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Friends, this is why the prosperity gospel is so attractive and so dangerous and so, so popular. It feeds upon people's innate desire to be financially well off. Second variance of what the Bible actually says versus what we often hear that money is the root of all evil. Notice, notice that the Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It is a root of all kinds of evil, right? What is a root? It's an underlying cause, right? And Paul's being very specific here because we know that the love of money is not the supreme cause of every act and every category of evil. However, money can be and is a prominent underlying cause of much of the evil in the world. It, it, it's, it doesn't cause every act of evil, but we're going to see in just a moment, <laughs> there's hardly an act of evil that cannot be rooted in the love of money. And that brings us to the third, this third difference. It's not all evil, but all kinds of evil. Again, every evil act is not motivated by the love of money, but there's hardly any category of evil that money cannot be the root cause of. Here's a few. Selfishness, lying. Stealing, cheating, neglecting good causes, bribery, extortion, 
fraud, robbery, envy, hatred, violence, murder, exploitation, betrayal, drug trafficking, prostitution. I think I made the case. Paul squarely returns to the false teachers and no doubt some of their followers by stating this. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith. Again, this word craving speaks of a desire that's not easily satisfied. So a person expends much effort and much energy trying to satisfy this craving that they have. Now, if you've ever been pregnant or married to someone who is, you know that oftentimes with pregnancy comes these late night cravings. There's a certain food that I just can't get my mind off and I am not going to be able to go to sleep until I get that food. That requires a lot of effort, usually on the part of the husband to go into town or go into the shop or go into the chipper in order to get that food to satisfy this longing or craving. The kind of craving Paul is speaking about here. And it's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith. The word wander speaks of a gradual steering off course. It's not a, not a 180. It's not a, not a U-turn. It's just gradual drifting off course. Little by little, compromise by compromise, bit by bit. And how do they end up? They've wandered away from the faith and they've pierced themselves with many pangs. To be pierced is to be punctured with a sharp implement. If you can think of an animal that's been pierced all the way through with a spit or a skewer and then just slowly turns being roasted on and over an open fire. That's the imagery that Paul is, is bringing here when he uses the word pierced. Been pierced with many pangs, many feelings of pain, pain in every area of life. Caused by what? The love of money. How do, we, how do we respond to what we've seen in these five verses this morning? How, how can we today leave here and, and, and learn from what Paul is, is saying here to the church in Ephesus? Because I believe he's speaking clearly to us today. How do, how do we guard our own hearts in this area? How do we go about the business of uprooting the love of money from our own hearts? Because I can tell you this, if you don't do that, the weeds of temptation and desire are going to continue to pop up. You know, when you mow your lawn and you run over the dandelion, looks nice, but next week it's back up. Why? Because the root is still there. To answer this question, let me ask another question by way of review. What is the key to gain in the Christian walk? What did Paul tell us? It's godliness marked by contentment. If you remember Philippians 4, contentment doesn't come easy. It doesn't come natural to us. What did Paul say? I have learned to be content. The question then becomes, how do we learn contentment ourselves? In conclusion, I want to offer us five practical steps towards learning to be content. Number one, recognize and remember Christ has promised to meet our every need. Christ has promised to meet our every need. We need to own that. We need to believe that. We need to trust that. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 13, 5 says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he, Jesus, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus, when he walked the earth, used the birds of the air and the lilies of the field to illustrate this very point. If he meets their needs, how much more? Is he willing to do for his own children? And can I just say here this morning, your greatest need this morning is to be reconciled to God. If you're not a follower of Christ this morning, your greatest need is not more money. 
Your, your greatest need is not to read your Bible more, to, to come to church. You, you need your sin forgiven. Why would I say that? Because the idea is not contentment alone. It's, it's godliness with contentment. And again, the Holy Spirit alone produces godliness. It's this work of sanctification in our lives. So this morning, I would, I would implore you, if you've never turned from sin and you never trusted in Jesus Christ this morning, that's, that's step one to get settled in your heart. And if you don't know what that means or you want to know more about what that means or you don't know how to do that, then please get in touch with Hope Community Church. Find us on Facebook. Find us on Instagram. Email us. Go to our website. There's, it's easy to get in touch with us. We want you above all, to be walking with the Lord and for you to be able to trust the promise that he's promised to meet our every need. Number two, in order to learn contentment, we need to learn to distinguish between our wants and our needs. Here's the reality. Most of us in the West, we all have a certain amount of disposable income meaning income that we get to decide and get to choose to spend how we want to spend it. God gives us true freedom to make such choices. We can spend it however we want. But see, the problem is not, not what we spend on. Again, the problem is our heart. Why are we going after those things? Is it truly a need in our life? Or is it something that we just want? And I would, again, I would say there's nothing problem with having a few things that you want. The problem is where's your heart in pursuing that purchase? Again, we're not called to live impoverished lives or take vows of poverty. We're called to live simplistic lives. So much in the world promises the key to a simple life is more stuff. And the stuff we buy to simplify our life just oftentimes makes our life all the more complicated. Or like the guy who had an abundance of crops and his crops came in and he had to build bigger barns and bigger barns to store it on. What did Jesus tell him? You fool. Tonight, your soul will be required from you. So learn to distinguish between wants and needs. Number three, learn to live beneath your means. Learn to live beneath your means. What does that mean? Spend less than you make. The most recent statistics I could find was from a couple of years ago that said that Ireland had the fifth, ranked fifth highest in the EU of household debt. The average household debt in Ireland equates to about 28000 euro per person. How does this happen? Well, we buy what we want and not necessarily only what we need. And these things that we want just get added. These things we buy that we want get added to the collection of other things that we don't need. We need to, we need to determine a standard of living, living that we're going to adhere to. How much is enough? You get to make that decision. There's no verse in the Bible that I can point you to to tell you this is how much you need. You and your relationship with God as he transforms your heart get to make that decision. Mr. Rockefeller, who I uh, quoted in the introduction, was asked at one time, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money is enough? His answer, just a little more. Do, do you see the perpetual struggle that that brings. Learn to live beneath your means. Decide how much is enough for you and your family. Number four, learn to be a generous giver. Learn to be a generous giver. Someone has said it this way, the only antidote to greed is generosity. Generosity. I ask you to stay in Philippians chapter four earlier. Turn back there for me in just a moment because there's another verse that I love, it's a fantastic promise, it's a beautiful promise, and it's one that I would say, this is one of those promises that is for you and is for me today. You know not every promise in the Bible is for you. This one is. 
if you're a follower of Christ. Here's the verse, chapter 4, verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Jesus. We read that and we say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What a great promise from God. And I echo that. It is a great promise from God. I want us to see the context of that promise from God. Go back up to verse 16. Paul's writing to the Philippians here and he tells them, even in Thessalonica, you Philippians sent me help for my needs once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your account. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Verse 19. I could, inter- I could inter- insert this little comment here. And because of your generosity, because of your giving, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This blessing from God, that this promise for God to to supply every need, is based on Paul's recognition of the generosity of the Philippian church. Maybe some of you are thinking, oh, okay, so the way to get things from God is to give to God. Check your heart. Check your heart. This, this is going to ch- require a change in our mindset, a change in our heart. And so when we do receive gifts, we do receive income, we do receive financial gain, we need to change our mindset. Usually, here's what we ask. What can I get with this money. We need to change this mindset. How much of this can I give to the kingdom of God? What a challenge. That leads me to the fifth and final step towards learning contentment. Not really steps, but principles. Number five, strive to build the kingdom of God and not our own. Matthew 6, Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Then in verses 19 and 20 of Matthew 6, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Seek first the kingdom of God. Do you know an easy way to determine a person's priorities? Well, in the old days, we would say, look in their checkbook. But I think that might might need to update that reference pretty soon. Look on their banking app and see where they're spending their money. That is unequivocally, without question, going to say something about the priority of where a person spends their money. Is your money being spent to build your kingdom or to build God's kingdom? Giving to the local church to affect the outreach and care of the community, local community, to, to giving to missions to see the worldwide spread of the gospel, to giving towards relief organizations to help those who are in need. What priorities does your spending reflect? May the Lord guard our own hearts and free us from the love of money. May we truly, with the help of God, by his Holy Spirit, learn to be contentment. Learn to be content. Why is that? Because godliness with contentment is a great gain. Let's pray. It's a great gain. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it's not just philosophy, it's not just high-minded talk, but it's so practical. It so reaches right into our souls and puts its finger on areas in our lives where 
we may need to, from time to time, have a tune-up and a change. Lord, there's no area more controversial, more, more prone to lead us astray, as we've seen from our passage today, than the area of money. God, I pray we would be a kingdom-minded church, a church that's consumed with not building an empire here on earth that we've seen today will just will not go with us when we go. But, Lord, that we would seek to invest our time and our energy and, yes, even our money to seeing your kingdom built here on earth while we can. God, would you help us? Would you help me to be a good steward? Would you protect us from the love of money? Would you protect us from the, the, the temptations and the snare of the evil one to entrap us? Would you, would you set us free from debt and from the pursuit of more stuff that we may be godly and content with you and what you choose to entrust to us? I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.